Chapter 4, The Uncertain Life of an African Farmer To me, graduating primary school and being a scientist was loads better than farming, which by then was taking up a lot of my time. As much as I enjoyed my holiday break, most of it was filled by helping my father prepare the maize for harvest. In Malawi, maize is as important as the water we drink. We eat maize for every meal, mostly in the form of nasima, which is kind of a doughy porridge. Nasima is made by mixing maize flour and hot water. When it becomes too thick to stir, you scoop it out and form cakes in the shape of hamburger patties. To eat nasima, you tear off a piece and roll it into a ball in your palm, then use it to scoop up your relish, stewed spinach, pumpkin leaves, or whatever happens to be in season. If your family is fortunate, maybe you also have some eggs, chicken, or goat meat to go along with it. My favorite meal in the world is nasima with dried fish and tomatoes. Yum! As I said, nasima is so important to our diets that whenever we go without it, we feel like a fish out of water. For instance, let's say that someone from America invites a Malwe into dinner and serves plates of juicy steak and mashed potatoes followed by great slices of chocolate cake for dessert. If there's no nasima, the Malwean will probably go home and tell his brothers and sisters, there was no food there, only steak and mashed potatoes. I hope I can sleep tonight. Growing a good maize crop is difficult and takes the whole year. It's not just the planting and harvesting that kept us busy, but also preparing the soil, adding fertilizer, and killing the weeds that grew around the plants. Such work requires every person in the family. My sisters helped with the planting and harvesting, but mostly they assisted my mother around the house, fetching water and firewood, cooking and cleaning, and helping take care of the little ones, which meant that most of the field work fell on me. We began in July when we cleared the remnants of the previous season's harvest. We collected the old maize stalks and placed them into piles. Once they were arranged, Jeffrey and I set them on fire. The best thing about burning stalks were the grasshoppers. The insects liked to burrow in the piles, and once they saw smoke swarmed out by the hundreds, we caught them and put them into sugar bags. How many do you have, Mr. Jeffrey, I'd ask, huffing through the smoky fields? Lots, he'd say, holding up his bag. Maybe 50. Yeah, same here. Shall we eat? For sure. The only reason we caught grasshoppers was to roast them over a fire with salt, which we did with great excitement. This might sound disgusting to some people, but trust me, there's nothing more delicious than crunchy roasted grasshoppers with Nasima. Of course, Jeffrey and I weren't supposed to be hunting and eating grasshoppers while we worked, but in Malwai, we have a saying, when you go to see the lake, you also see the hippos. The hardest work in farming was making ridges. These are the long dirt rows that you see in any field. On my farm, we didn't use a plow or a tractor to dig them, but a hoe and digging them took all of my time. I'd start in the morning before school, wake up at 4 a.m. when the land was still dark and cool. My mother would be ready with a steaming bowl of fala, which is a kind of oatmeal made from maize. After eating, I'd stumble down the trail, dragging my hoe behind me. Be careful with that hoe in the dark, my father would call out. I don't want you cutting off your foot. For sure. The big bright moon threw creepy shadows along the road. I walked quickly, trying not to think about Gulewa Kumkula, watching me from the trees or the witch planes that flew overhead looking for fresh recruits. One morning while I was walking, a hyena called out from the bush, Woo-wee! and caused me to jump out of my trousers. I've never run so fast. After digging ridges, we waited for the rainy season so we could plant. The rains usually came the first week in December. My sisters and I moved in a line down the rows. One person made a gash with a hoe while the other dropped three seeds then covered them with soil and a lot of good wishes. A couple of weeks later, when the seedlings pushed through the ground, we gave each other a spoonful of fertilizer to help them grow strong. Buying seeds and fertilizer cost a lot of money, and because it always happened in December, sometimes it meant there wasn't much left for Christmas. We never had money to buy presents, especially because we had a lot of kids. So for us, the perfect holiday was simply enjoying a luxurious meal of chicken and rice together. If there was any money left over, perhaps we'd get a bottle of Coca-Cola from the market, along with some dandy sweets. Then, after December, all the money was gone. Worse, by this time, most families' maize supplies were also running low. Outside, it rained night and day. It was a time when people tightened their belts and waited for the harvest, which didn't arrive until May. That's when the maize stalks finally stretched above my father's head, and a whole green field would whisper your fortunes in the wind. Harvest was like one giant party. Everyone in the family headed into the rows and worked from sunup till sundown, singing, telling jokes, dreaming about the great meals to come. 
After we'd spent a week shucking the ears, the maize was placed in giant bags that went back in the storage room, giving us another year's worth of delicious food. In a good harvest, the bags rose to the ceiling and spilled into the hallway. For poor families like ours, it was like putting a million dollars in the bank. But that was in a normal year. In December 2000, everything went terribly wrong. Our first problem was the fertilizer. For years and years, the Malwayan government made sure the price of fertilizer and seed was low enough so every family could afford a crop. But our new president, a businessman named Bakili Muluzi, didn't believe the government's job was to help farmers. So that year, the price of fertilizer was so expensive that most families, ours included, couldn't afford to buy it. That meant when the rains came and the seedlings pushed their way through the soil, we had nothing to give them. Sorry, guys, I said as I stood in the field. You're on your own this year. For those farmers who were able to afford fertilizer, it hardly mattered anyways, because as soon as the seedlings showed their tiny faces, the country began to flood. Heavy rains fell for days and days, washing away houses and livestock along with the fertilizer and many of the seedlings themselves. Our district survived without much damage, except that after the rains finally stopped, they never came back. Malway entered a drought. With no rain, the sun rose angry in the sky each morning and showed no mercy on the seedlings that had survived. By February, the stalks were wilted and bent toward the ground. By May, half our crop was scorched. The plants that remained were only as high as my father's chest. If you took one of the leaves in your hand, it would crumble to dust. One afternoon, my father and I stood in the field and studied this destruction. What will happen to us next year, Papa? I asked. He let out a sigh. I don't know, son, but at least we're not alone. It's happening to everyone. There was no celebration that harvest. We managed to fill only five bags of maize, which occupied only a corner of the storage room. One night before bed, I saw a kerosene lamp flickering in the hallway and found my father standing in the open door. He was staring at those bags, but not like a man counting his riches. He seemed to be asking them a question. Whatever they told him, we'd find out soon enough.